Um, I would now like to call the September 16th, 2020 Longmont Sustainability Advisory Board meeting to order. Um, can we start with a ro roll call and then we'll welcome the new members? Sure. Um, Annie Noble. I'm here. Francy Jaffe. Here. Um, Tim Ellis. Here. Um, Atra Nusrat. Here. Charles Caminides. Here. Um, Heather McIntyre is here as well. And for the board members, we have Kate Collardson. I'm here. Uh, Mary Lynn. Here. Adam Reed. Here. Uh, Violetta Manukian. Here. Uh, Charles Musgrave. Here. And Jim Metcalf. Here. And Council Member uh, Christensen. Here. Thank you. And we have a quorum. Chair, we do have a quorum. Okay. Uh, first off, I'd like to welcome the new uh, board members, Autumn and Charles. Uh, would you uh, please take a minute to tell us a little bit about yourselves? Adam, we'll start with you. Sure. My name is Adam, and I'm a physicist. I started out working in renewable energy, and now I work on quantum science and technology which is what I focused on at graduate school at, C at uh, the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, outside the lab, I enjoy working on science policy, and I'm also interested in issues related to sustainable development. Great, welcome, thank you. Charles. So I'm uh, Charles Musgrave. I am a the, <coughs> um, resident of Longmont for the last 12 years. We moved here from California in 2007. And um, I used to be on the faculty at Stanford University and then moved here to be on the faculty at CU. I'm also um, Associate Dean of Graduate Studies of Engineering at um, the College of Engineering at CU Boulder. So I appreciated James's uh, letter as well. And I work in renewable energy. I'm actually a quantum chemist. So I use quantum mechanical methods for studying chemical reactivity and chemical processes in, uh, related to um, renewable energy and energy storage. Very cool. Charles, I, I did my PhD at Stanford, so we're moving around the country. <laughs> yes. I'll have to talk about that sometime. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, thanks for that, and th uh, welcome to the board. Thanks for being here. Um, I, I, at this, now it's time to uh, approve the minutes from the last meeting. I was not present at the last meeting, so um, can somebody else make a motion? I will move to approve the meeting, the minutes from the last meeting. I'll okay, second that. Great. Uh, all in favor? Raise aye. your hand or say aye. Yeah. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. The uh, minutes are approved. Uh, at the, I would now like to open it up for the public uh, to be heard. Each person wishing to speak will be unmuted to speak one at a time. When it is your turn to speak, please state your name and address for the record. You will have three minutes for comment. And I will time you. Uh, we do have Jenny Black with us today, but I don't believe that she had any comments that she wanted to make. Um, okay. I do have a couple that I received um, via email that I would like to read into the record. The first is from um, Doe Kelly. It was a follow-up from last month's meeting. She was just actually letting us know that the um, website for the um, Colorado for Safe Technology um, address has changed and it's now https colon forward slash forward slash co the number four safe tech dot com. 
And then the um, other comment that we had is from Jessica Davis at 2221 Longs Peak Avenue. She said, um, I was wondering if you could share some thoughts um, with the advisory board. There are thousands and thousands of studies showing dangers of smart meters and the radiation associated with them. Every individual in Longmont should have the right to choose whether they want to be near something with such vast negative health effects. It is my hope that members of the board will take the time to educate themselves on the numerous studies that are available that detail its negative health impacts. Thank you for listening to my concerns. Sincerely, Jessica Davis. That's all we have. Okay, thank you. Are there any um, revisions uh, to the agenda or documents to be submitted? Um, I, I don't know if it's uh, possible to make this revision at this time, still learning the rules here, but we discussed in the last meeting, uh, scheduling a conversation regarding making this board a commission, and yet we didn't schedule that. So could we add that to the agenda that we talk about scheduling a time to have that conversation? Yes, Annie, I see you. Um, so I just wanted to let you guys know that that is on the agenda later to discuss. I followed up on um, okay. that question. And so there will be an opportunity. Um, I'm going to present some information. And Thank you, Annie. Can, yeah. I'd read the agenda and I, did, I, I didn't see that for some reason. I don't know what's wrong with my brain today. Thank you. Well, um, 8A. Thanks. Yeah, 8A. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, then we can move on to general business. Uh, I Please, board members, uh, I'm, we ask that you hold your comments and questions until the end of each presentation. Please wait until after each person has presented for any comments or questions. And so first up, we have an update on the Climate Action Task Force and next steps from Annie. Thank you. Heather, can you start the presentation? Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Never know if you're muted or not muted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna give a brief update on the climate action recommendations. Um, next slide, please. So as a reminder, um, the Climate Action Task Force had identified 27 recommendations that fell into six topic areas. And um, there was also a joint uh, just transition plan committee um, that identified equity as um, part of that, well, as did the Climate Action Task Force. And the just transition plan committee came up with an assessment and identified recommendations to be developed into a checklist for each of these. Um, these recommendations were taken to council in June, on June 30th and July 7th, and council directed staff to get feedback from advisory boards. Next slide, please. Um, so all of the climate action recommendations were presented to the Transportation Advisory Board, the Sustainability Board, the Parks Board, Water Board, and the Longmont Downtown Development Authority, but boards had only provided feedback on the areas that fell within their purview. And so, as you remember, the Sustainability Board voted on all 27 recommendations, and that was at the July 15th meeting. So all of this feedback was presented to council on August 25th, and staff re requested direction from council on whether to move forward, which, which recommendations to move forward, and on the proposed next steps. Next slide, please. So, Council approved moving forward with all 27 recommendations um, and to complete a, an evaluation of all 27. So staff is currently working on that evaluation. We're looking at six areas I think we came, came up with, but those areas include cost, greenhouse gas reduction potential, resources that are needed for each of these and the timelines, and then community and equity impacts. And then we're gonna bring that information back um, after we do that evaluation and 
basically make a recommendation on how to prioritize those 27 recommendations into near-term, mid-term, and long-term improvements or projects. Um, so um, we're going to bring that back to council for approval, and we will be providing an update to the sustainability board on those um, on that assessment. So that's likely going to come back to you in October, and then um, we're not exactly sure when we'll take it back to council. It's a pretty lengthy process, so there, you know, given there's 27 recommendations, but um, we will be providing an update to council during the budget process, and we're hoping to bring it back to the sustainability board in October. Um, so that's, that's basically it. Um, I just wanted you guys to know what was happening with that. So you will get a chance to see it again. And um, we appreciate your comments and we pass those along. I think in your packet, um, there might be a copy of all the board recommendations and of the council packet that went in August. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Annie. Okay. Uh, so next we have the sustainability tax discussion. Um, for, uh, and the person presenting is Atara Nusra? Hi. Yes, Atara Nusra. Atara, sorry. No worries. You have the floor. Okay. Um, Heather, I realized I put animations in my slides, so you're going to have to be pressing that forward button quite a lot, I'm afraid. Okay, no problem. <laughs> if we can... Yep, give me one it. second here. That's great, thank you. That's great. Okay. So I think all of the board members were present at the last meeting where I presented this. Um, just to review, I'll just be giving the same presentation, but slightly expanded with a little bit more background about the sustainability tax and a little bit more detail about the different options that we want you to discuss and prioritize. So um, if we go to the next slide. So we're looking at the Boulder County sustainability tax. Next slide. So this is the background. So you will have received information in your packet. I believe Annie sent the city communication um, from last year and we included that in your packet. Gives you background to how the sustainability tax came into being. In November 2016, vo voters from Boulder County approved a countywide sustainability tax and the aim is to fund sustainability infrastructure and programs. A portion of the tax revenue provides funding to Boulder County cities and towns through an annual application, which requires 25% match. So that's the process that we're involved in and that we're seeking your input for. The Environmental Sustainability Matching Grant Program is the mechanism through which the sustainability tax is distributed. So sometimes you will hear those two terms, they're essentially synonymous. The amount allocated to each community is based on population and the sustainability tax took effect in 2020, expires in 2035. I think there's one more bullet point, Heather. Yeah. And Longmont share last year was 125,800 and the city offered the cash, cash match of $32,000. So last year was the first year of the sustainability tax coming into effect. So the next slide. These are the parameters that the sustainability tax covers. Um, they want categories to fall within climate, ecological health, energy and buildings, local food and agriculture, transportation, water conservation, zero waste sustainability planning and commercial sector sustainability. So projects need to meet at least one of those criteria. And these are the parameters of the projects that need to comply with the grant um, funding. So you need to have spent all of the funds within the same calendar year. The fund does support um, ongoing sustainability services, including staff for up to three years. Partial funds can be used in years four and five to ramp down the reliance on the sustainability tax. 
then ideally after that, the funds would be shifted over to city budgets or the position would be ended. It also supports capital projects to a limited degree. And the last bullet point, there should be one more here. Um, there's one um, restriction, the fund won't support electric vehicles if they can qualify for funding from the Regional Air Quality Council. So go ahead. So this is what we had funded last year. So the 125,800 with the 25% match covered the first two items, which was a sustainability grant coordinator position and residential program coordinator. Those two part-time positions were combined into one. We funded the carbon free transportation roadmap, which has been, I can't remember if it's actually been delivered or it's still in draft um, and it's being reviewed by the city staff. The Neighborhood Impact Granting Program. I'll speak a little bit more about this shortly. You'll have to bear with me. I've got a bit of a cold. So my, my voice might give out a little bit. And then the Women, Infant and Children's Farmers Market Program. So we funded that as well. And we provided the $32,000 match across these um, different programs. So what we want to do now is look at the context of prioritizing projects for 2021. As Annie mentioned, we have the Climate Action Task Force and Just Transmission Com Just Transition Committee recommendation context that we're operating in. So we want to make sure that any priorities that we select now are in line with those recommendations, and we also want them to align with the Sustainability Plan and Envision Long Run. There is a possibility that we'll have reduced funding this year. A Boulder County has advised us to anticipate a potential 20% reduction in funds. So the total amount could be anywhere between $100,000 and $125,000. Our existing commitment is the two-year position for the grant and program coordinator. So that already accounts for over $50,000 of that potential 125. And the neighborhood impact granting program, which we also funded in 2020, that would be a top priority um, going forward into 2021 to establish long-term sustainability for that program. So that leaves us with potentially 25 to $50,000 of grant funding available. The match funding would also be on top of that, depending on how that's allocated across the projects. So that could be anywhere between, if I've got my math right, somewhere between $33,000 and $66,000, if all of the match funding is applied to, the, to new projects. So in terms of trying to identify gaps and needs for 2021, we're looking at the current framing context to complement the Climate Action Task Force recommendations. We want to ensure that projects strengthen equity, improve accessibility, support immediate needs, and uh, alleviate impacts from COVID. So the way this translates concretely is projects that fall within adaptation resilience, community engagement, and expansion of existing sustainability programs. So you just saw this moments ago with Annie. What I've done here, these 27 recommendations from the Climate Action Task Force report, um, I've highlighted the areas that overlap with the projects that we're prioritizing and that we want you to review. So you can see we have overlap in adaptation resilience, education and outreach, and building energy use and renewable energy for expanding existing programs. We go forward. So I'm just gonna go through some of the items that we prioritize. And um, these are detailed in the memo that was sent with your packet. So this is our um, preferred priority for funding, the community engagement, climate equity and engagement specialist. <coughs> Excuse me. And the sustainability team has limited capacity for um, additional outreach and we feel that to support some of the recommendations coming out of the task force report, we do need support in this area. So this would be to support sustainability and climate action implementation. This could be either for a part or full-time position. And as you saw, the sustainability tax can not fund up to three years of a position. Um, we feel it's particularly timely with COVID-19 where outreach is proven to be more difficult. So additional funding and support would be very beneficial. So next one. <clears throat> In terms of adaptation resilience, um, we're looking at some software 
options, and um, Francie might be able to speak to this as well. We're doing some research around climate vulnerability and risk mapping software. The idea is to understand community vulnerability to impacts of climate, such as heat islands, <clears throat> impervious services, and overlay census demographics so you can kind of see what, which populations and communities are most impacted across Longmont and identify and prioritize the community-based needs, such as access to open spaces, tree canopy, et cetera. And then together with that information, identify potential recommendations to address those vulnerabilities. Um, the last bullet point um, is in relationship to a program that was identified last year. Um, I believe Lisa Noblock, the sustainability coordinator, um, identified a need with the forestry services department where they have a low income tree program, which will also address adaptation resilience. I'll speak about this a little bit more. <clears throat> so you saw this slide last time. It's an example of some software at the state level where you have overlays of climate hazard, climate scenarios and population demographics. So our idea is to take this kind of software, but drill down further into the city level and potentially even smaller, uh, more granular level, perhaps potentially at the neighborhood level. So we feel as though we, we would like that to help implementation and planning projects going forward. Um, this is a little bit of detail about the low income tree program with forestry services. They have some budget for this, but they don't currently have capacity. Um, if we were able to provide further funding, that would assist them. The goal is to assist residents with less means to obtain low cost trees for private property planting and to help to build tree canopy in low income areas of Longmont. So they would use the funding to treat and prune private ash trees for canopy preservation. So that's another project that we could potentially support. And then the last category is expanding existing programs. So there's the SOL program, which was launched this year, Sustainable Opportunities, Lifestyle and Leadership. The Sustainable Neighborhood Solutions Program, which is synonymous with Neighborhood Impact Granting Program. Um, I'll speak a bit more about that. That essentially grants funding at this point to neighborhoods to um, carry out local sustainability projects. Um, the last two bullet points, WIC and CARE. Uh, since I submitted my packet to you last week, I spoke with uh, LPC and the CARE program, which is in relationship to um, low income housing, energy efficiency upgrades is, is funded sufficiently. So we wouldn't need to support that. And likewise with WIC, the Women's and Infant Children's Farmers Program, they have sufficient funding also through the sustainability tax through a different avenue. So last bullet point, with our existing programs, we would need to confirm staff capacity. <clears throat> so going forward. So this is just a little bit more detail about the SOL program. It was launched this year. It's based on the long month sustainability plan. The idea is to work very much alongside residents um, so that they can learn about best practice and um, residents receive free home eco improvements and have the opportunity to collect to qualifying city services. Um, it's volunteer led. We've trained local Longmont residents to actually perform the eco upgrade, upgrades and share best practice. And the Sustainable Neighborhood Solutions or Neighborhood Impact Granting Program. Again, that was launched this year, providing funding opportunities to neighborhood groups to implement sustainability projects. I think we've made one award so far. Um, James, you were part of that. <laughs> yeah. And um, additional resources in 2021 would allow community group training and further tools to increase group capacity. And the long-term vision for this program would to continue to build group capacity, also in project management skills, and to help conduct community assessments, provide tools to help conduct community assessments that help identify community project opportunities. So this has got a, a long-term vision to it, which could be benefited, very beneficial for Longmont communities. Um, we just did a quick cross check against our different plans and they all, they all check ac across the sustainability plan and vision long one and the climate action just transition recommendations and the climate vulnerability and risk mapping also uh, addresses the Bowler County hazard mitigation plan. So what we're asking for really is if you were to just review these, these 
items that I've listed and prioritized them in order of preference given the limited funds that are available. We'll take back your input to city leadership and then report back to you um, on October 21st and seek your approval. And then once notified of funding, we take the IGA to the council for approval. So um, that's just a summary of the different programs and um, I'm handing it back to the board for discussion. Great. Thank you uh, for that. I, I have one clarifying question and I, I think that if we are to, if we need to prioritize your list, could, could that uh, remain up on the screen for everyone to see so we can um, have yeah, our well, the second to last screen should work. Over. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Now, my question is about the, um, the low income tree program. Did, did I understand you correctly that those are where that ash trees are being offered and that's all, or uh, did I misunderstand that? I've taken information that I've been given. So that's as far as I'm aware. If anybody else knows more, it looks like Polly does know more about this particular program. Thanks. Uh, I think if you go back to that screen, I, I, I also thought the same thing. I thought, what, we're adding ash trees? I think it is to prune to prune, uh, them. prune the ash trees that are already diseased in an attempt to uh, and treat them in an attempt yes. to preserve them. So that's not adding new ash trees, which we don't need. It's, it's a separate thing. But I'm, a lot of the low-income people live in traditional neighborhoods like me, and um, we already have uh, the tree, uh, what's called the tree lawn, the rest of us refer to as the hell strip, um, is planted already by the city. So I'm not sure that, I think that would have kind of a minimal impact, although okay. trees well, are what we love about, one of the yeah. many things we love about Longmont. <laughs> I'm also curious whether or not this, I mean, um, I, I'm i sure there are low income people who own their own property and would want help with trees, but I also feel that probably a lot of people that we might want to target might be renting. And whether or not this, this program is going to be kind of targeted at trying to find places we need trees and finding ways to put the trees in there, or whether it's going to be for like people like me who can probably afford to buy trees, but if there's a program that could help me buy a tree, I might go for it. And that might not be the most efficient use of, mm -hmm. of city tax money. Right. I mean, we listed this almost as a subset of the adaptation resilience program. Um, so I think if we were to remain in the risk mapping area, that would probably be sufficient. Um, yeah, Violetta. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Atira. That, that was my pronouncing your name right. That's fine. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. And one of the slides of existing programs, there was a cash match, and there was the WIC, the Women, Infant, and Children. What is, uh, what's a cash match? It's the amount of money that the city um, provides. So the grant provides so much amount of money and... Oh, you mean that 25%? Yes. Oh, okay. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and what's the Women, Infant and Children program do? That was a farmer's market program. So I believe they provided curbside um, food to families of low income. So um, I don't have a sufficient well, background on that at the moment, but this was a program that we funded last year. This is a... Yeah. Food distribution to I yeah I, Francie I think so. um, I believe it's because this year it was a food distribution due to COVID. I believe in normal years it's addition to the similar to the double up food bucks where you can go and use your SNAP dollars. It's additional funding that WIC those who participate participate in the women, infants, and children program. It's a federal program can then use that money at the farmer's market because this year it was, everything was remote. I believe that's why it was more, a more remote program this year. 
thank you. Yeah, Mary. Thank you. Um, I'm interested to know if there is some kind of an overarching uh, planning strategy or philosophy for, for choosing trees that are included in the tree canopy uh, along the lines of sort of an urban, um, ur an urban ecology program. Uh, I, 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 it seems that there tends to usually in cities be in a presumption that we're, we're just going to be on sort of alien species island and that we don't really need to consider the environment surrounding a, a city and that residents should be able to sort of have um, free choice in terms of what they bring in. But I'm wondering if there um, are any guiding principles to bring us more in alignment with the um, surrounding environment and you know to make sure that we're not introducing invasives and so forth. Uh, Polly, did you have an answer? Um, yeah, I can answer that, um, Mary, because I, I had a tree that had to be taken down years ago because it was dead and it was an, uh, an elm, but, um, and it was in the tree lawn, so the, it, it's up to the city, but they do definitely have um, principles upon which they guide it. They don't want to, and I also had a, a choice of say five or six trees and I suggested one that wasn't on the list, a Kentucky coffee tree, um, for various reasons that had to, having to do with my research, but my research wasn't particularly good because the city forester said that doesn't really, that is not native here and it won't do very well and we're not gonna put it in. And so they, they do um, try to uh, introduce trees that will do well and that are hardy, that do not use a lot of water, things like that, you know, and it's changed over time. But um, anyway, I had two questions though to, for Atara. This is, uh, and forgive me if that's not the right pronunciation. That's totally fine. Well, okay. <laughs> you always mispronounce my name too. But, People say um, it in lots of different ways. So. It's a very pretty name. Thank you. This is a really good pre presentation. Um, are those SOLL positions paid? Are they all volunteer? They are volunteer at this point. Okay, in time. so they go through training, but then it's a, still a volunteer position. Mm -hmm. And the neighborhood impact program, I'm not too clear on what, what happens there. So um, can we go to that slide, please, Heather? And Jim is probably gonna be able to chime into that one as well. Um, so, from what I understand, it's the next slide, I believe, or maybe it's even further, uh, after Sol. Is this offered through our um, neighborhood group association? I don't it, think it's offered through that. Okay. No, go, go ahead, James, do you want to speak to that? It's a different thing. Well, it, there, so the, the idea is that the neighborhood group associations can apply to it. Right. So, um, uh, we've had we've had two meetings now for these. The idea was that we have something around thirty five thousand dollars that we are able to give out in uh, grants, and we were going to do three cycles of grants. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, it's it's been interesting. Um, we've only awarded one. We we haven't had a, a lot of submissions yet, and I don't know if perhaps expanding this means that. Um, Advertising it better uh, is would be important, but also I think perhaps developing some guidelines and some tools for people who want to apply for these funds mm -hmm. to uh, be able to make uh, more um, robust requests uh, could be helpful. I, so far, it mm -hmm. seems like it's a. I, I like the idea in theory. I just. I don't see it being totally taken adv uh, advantage of yet. But right. um, yeah, so. Uh, it's, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think people, I don't think we've publicized it very well. I mean, I don't even really understand it and I'm on city council, yeah. so that doesn't mean anything. But um, um, I do think it's a, it's a good idea, but I, I would say that one thing we really need to make a priority is pe keeping people in their housing mm. and, um, there are a lot of low-income people living in houses that were built in 
1900 and they can't afford to fix them. They can't afford to make them better. They're paying a fortune in um, utilities and uh, it's, yeah, and it's, it's the problem. And that, I, that is one of the areas, sorry, that's one of the areas that SOL can help identify and address as well. So what we're doing, we're going into people's homes. One, we're providing free eco home upgrades, but we're also assessing different areas. There are, of the 10 topics, the sustainability topics in the sustainability plan, we're going through each of those areas and trying to see are there behavior changes that we can support people with. And so there is one section about building an infrastructure. So we can point people in the direction of different city services that they, where they can find additional support. So it addresses a lot of different areas, that particular program. I'm in a meeting. Okay, <laughs> um, okay thanks. Uh, Polly, did we get your, did yes, you get both of your questions? Thank you. Okay, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, okay, I've seen uh, Adam uh, had his hand up, then Mary, uh, I, I did see Violetta with her hand up and I see Charles as well. Uh, so Adam, um, can you? Yeah, Mary asked the question that I was thinking of. I'll just echo the point that I do think native trees are important, not only um, for providing shade and surviving and drought-like conditions, but also because they can foster biodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, right. So I'll just underscore that point. But uh, I do have another question. And that is, I'm wondering if any of these programs address mental health services. I think that can be quite important in the wake of natural disasters Absolutely. and especially relevant uh, given uh, the current pandemic. Uh, can I respond to that? Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the one that has most potential is the risk mapping project. So I think that would ties to public health. So ideally it would be identifying where the climate risks are, what the, what impacts are actually happening in different parts of the community, seeing what they actually need. And if it's determined that mental health support is you know, one of the solutions, then we can actually back that up with the evidence from the risk mapping. So I think there would be a tie there with public health. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Mary? Um, thanks for uh, following up on that question, Adam. I wanna follow up on a little bit further. Um, it seems to me that um, in this, uh, that there's a number of different agendas that could be sort of tied together with some comprehensive and thoughtful research and planning um, related to bringing in, uh, using these funds to bring in various kinds of plants, including food for food security, um, getting folks gardening. Gardening is a great help with mental health issues. Um, in this, uh, time of COVID when we saw some uh, potential significant threats to our um, supply chains, everyone went out and bought seeds. You know, the, the uh, organic seeds companies are sold out three years in advance, some of them, two and three years in advance. Um, is there a way to bring in some uh, community gardens, uh, expand community gardens, um, and help people with the mental health issues. And then I wanna ask um, another question, which is about the urban food forest, which uh, city officials usually tend to not like them because they can create a lot of um, past waste with unharvested fruit in parks and so forth. And also a lot of these, um, the, the plants that are um, food plants aren't necessarily native plants. And I'm, I'm wondering if we can use the money to sort of up our sophistication and understanding of how to meet these multiple agendas of food security and mental health, tree canopy, and the local environment by maybe using some of that money to develop a more coordinated and sophisticated sort of plan integrating some of these different ideas. I'm sorry that was so many different points, but they all presented themselves in my mind at the same time. <laughs> That's wonderful. I'm, I'm actually going to call on Francie to help out in responding to that question about community gardens. Um, yeah. Also, um, urban food forests and, and urban food forests. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Mary, that's a, a great point. And I think something we're thinking about, and I'm kind of the answer to the previous question is that's where that um, climate vulnerability mapping and what's not included here, but something we already have funding for with our partnership with community neighborhood resources is they have funding to start doing community-based asset mapping. So 
identifying where there are community gardens or there's access to local food or access to different resources. So we're just starting to think through the process. If we can combine asset mapping with climate vulnerability mapping or access to different resources um, through kind of a access to opportunities mapping and combine these all into different uh, um, kind of this combo map with these two different things, we have the opportunity to highlight, okay, this neighborhood, we can really benefit this neighborhood here with adding in programs. So that's probably the one that we have that we're kind of thinking through of figuring out all those different things and starting that plan of addressing different things would be that asset map, uh, sorry, would be the climate vulnerability mapping that we would combine with another project um, that we are that we already have funding to do. Okay, but there's no crossover per se with the uh, funding um, that's available to community. So it sounds like you need you, you're trying to do a higher level st strategy within the city, and then that will turn into funds of this type at a later point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That'd be more accurate, yeah. Yes. Gosh, I was least excited about the mapping part of the <laughs> equation, but now it sounds the most exciting. Um, yeah, I'm but, excited to see that happening. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, if I'm correct on the order, we've got Violetta, Charles, and then uh, James. Okay, you're up after that. All right, Violetta. Um, thank you. I, I'm back at this SNS Neighborhood Impact Program. Um, I'm wondering if it could be combined with something like um, these community assessments could be done in um, conjunction in a partnership with like the Front Range Community College. If students could get uh, credit, you know, for a lot of them live in Longmont and they could do community assessments and then eventually get, you know, once they engage the community into designing some kind of project based on the needs of the assessment, then they could be trained for basic project management skills. So it would be a partnership between this program and the community uh, from Front Range College. I once participated in an excellent program like that. Um, you know, that kind of partnership, having students, in that case, it was training newly formed cooperatives in Peru, and students would get credit to do that. So, I think this would blend itself. And I was wondering why nobody had contacted me because I volunteer to be on a selection committee of this program in, um, I think it was in the June meeting, but it's only allocated one grant. So no wonder nobody contacted me to attend the selection committee because it, it does look like, um, People don't know about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering also if um, the material that advertises it is bilingual, if it's in Spanish and English. So, um, yeah, those were my thoughts. Uh, thank you, Violetta. What, what I can do is take those, back, those comments back to Wayne Tomac, who's the lead on this. He's um, based in community services. Um, there is information in quite a bit of detail on the website and the, in relationship to the procedures for application. But I will need to double check if that's also in Spanish. I know we are making significant efforts to do bilingual translation on the website. Um, so I'll, I'll double check that. Yeah, um, but you could get volunteers if you offer students, but you know, they would volunteer, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> to get credit. Yes. And it goes very nicely in CVs when they graduate. Yeah, no. I think, I mean, that would be part of the full rollout of the program. You're looking at the third bullet point there in terms of the community assessments. 
Well, it, it doesn't seem to be taking off, right? So well, this, I, this would be... I think we just launched it. I think that's, I think it's literally just been, it's a soft launch in terms of just getting it started. So... Yeah, but, it's very soft. I agree. <laughs> So I'm trying to give it a bit of a boost. yeah. No, I, I would I would definitely pass that back to to but Wayne in terms of now something could happen, you know, in um, next year in the next semester. Mm -hmm. It's late now for the fall semester, but something could happen. Thanks and for that feedback. Thank, thank you for you. considering it. Um, okay, uh, Charles. Uh, hey. Did Francie? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Do you mind if I add a, a response? Um, I, I want, not related to this grant proposal, but to the first one, which is the community engagement specialist. Um, I think both Atra and I completely agree that involving more volunteers, doing more community engagement, making sure everything's bilingual is very important for not only that program, but a lot of programs. But I think um, that we have limited staff capacity to, because even though we're, it's mostly volunteer run, you still need a staff member to train all the volunteers. So that's why we have this request for a climate equity and engagement specialist. Can I ask a, another question? I, I, I'm trying to get a, a grasp of what kinds of projects um, the city was thinking of when it created this grant program, um, the scale and um, the, in the engagement of citizens. I'm trying to sort of get an overall a feel for what the unmet need was considered to be at that time. I think if we go back, um, and Marilyn, please excuse me, but I'm picking up a little bit from where Lisa Knobloch left off before she went on maternity okay, leave. Sure, I understand. <laughs> So these are the priorities that she identified together with the team in terms of what we think are the main gaps and needs going forward into 2021 based on where we've gotten to so far and based on the current context of the climate action recommendations, just transition committee recommendations and the likely direction that the city council is gonna take going forward. So we wanna make sure that our framing context for projects that we select complement supplement and support the city direction and also meet um, our um, outreach needs to support climate equity um, and then in terms of making sure that we have sustainability for our programs that we've already launched. So that's kind of how we're framing it. So Can you give an example of what kind of a neighborhood, in, I wanted a, a sample um, grant, like for, for how much money for what specific kind of project you were thinking that would be used for? So you mean like it would be to create a community garden or would it be to put recycling bins in a park that had a lot of stuff that could be recycled as trash? Uh, just wonder, you know, just an example or two. So I've listed, I've listed three in this presentation. One is the climate um, risk mapping vulnerability project. Okay. Go ahead, Francie. Did you want to say yeah, something? Yeah. Um, if, if I, Mary, Mary, you're asking specifically about the neighborhood impact grants. And the yes, I'm asking about the neighborhood impact oh, okay. grants. Okay. So those are specifically, yeah. Yeah. So there's different levels for that grant. It can aim from funding something smaller to maybe bringing up, paying for a speaker to come in and educate folks. Okay the grant that was being, or to all the way to a water-wise landscape transition. So there's different levels. And so it has kind of, and the idea of the grant is that may, it can build. So maybe the first person comes in and has a, a, a lecture about water-wise landscaping. And then the next year they apply for actually doing the water-wise landscaping. So okay, that's helpful, so fancy, thank you. Sorry, Mary, I misunderstood. So the no, that's one okay. It's hard to hear on this technology. Yes. Yeah, so, so for example, the actual project that we funded this year was um, a webinar for water barrel, um, for rainfall water barrel collection. So they, they, okay. they ran a webinar and the, ideally on the back of that, they would actually be able to support people installing rain barrels. Got it. So it goes beyond 
in that case, for example, the one that you just mentioned, it goes beyond that particular neighborhood. Like that webinar, participants were from... Right. Yes, so, so I think one of the criteria is, is it reproducible? So that in terms of scoring projects, ideally right. projects are also reproducible across different neighborhoods. Okay. Um, I, I, know, I know Charles, I just uh, when we've been discussing these criteria on uh, a few people have requested funds for, um, for to bring speakers in on some topics. The rain barrel one was the one that we uh, recently funded in the, in the last go round. And I think that uh, for us, the uh, it being considered a neighborhood event changed a lot when everything had to go virtual. And now that everything can be virtual, there's no reason that you have to keep it to the number of people that can fit in the Elks Lodge or something like that, right? Um, so that's I think that's one of the criteria that's changed a little bit um, because everything is now virtual. That's helpful, James. Thank you. So, uh, me next. <laughs> so, um, so, so, um, it looks like there's been this consolidation for the sustainability staff from a three quarter time and a half time position into one full time position. If I, if I read that right. And I wondered if in this grant coordinator program coordinator position, um, and that's the bulk of the spending from this grant, um, does it include in the job responsibilities grant writing or yes. is grant writing? It does. Cause I would, I, I would suggest that, um, you know, with this grant is somewhere in the range of a dollar per Longmont resident per year, <laughs> which is not a lot of money, but if we thought of it in terms of seed money and had a significant fraction of this coordinator uh, position, be aimed at going after federal, state, and foundation funds that we could greatly expand uh, the reach and impact of the of uh, the, the different programs that we could fund. Mm -hmm. And so it's and I, it just I, so I don't know what the current and when you go from three quarters and a one half, I don't know what the I, I don't know what the job responsibilities or what fraction mm -hmm. and how much bandwidth they have. But thinking longer term in terms of um, raising additional funds, I think could, could be something that um, when we have these discussions in the future, we might be discussing how to spend a million dollars that year instead of 100 to 125,000. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's my role. Basically, it's split 50-50. So 50% 50 of my time is spent supporting departments within um, public works and natural resources and related departments which have a sustainability component to them to secure funds and also establishing better um, funding mechanism support within the city. So we wanna improve our ability to go for funding and actually improve our chances of securing funding by giving staff more time to go after the actual application. So I, I support different teams in putting applications together. So we recently were just awarded $25,000 from CDOT for the Main Street revitalization project. So that's, that's just come into being. And then we're working with GOCO as well. And we're putting an application in with DOLA. So we, we're working at the state level as well. So we have quite a few different irons in the fire. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Because the way we spend these funds, mm -hmm. in some ways we can use as uh, basically to give ourselves the credibility what we call in the grant business, you know, pre preliminary results mm -hmm. that we can go off and use uh, to make us more competitive for additional, um, you know, applications. Absolutely. So we, we want to use this wisely, as you said, because it's not a huge amount of money. So we can use this to explore areas that we wouldn't necessarily be able to do with more strictly um, ring fence funds within the city. So that's true. And then it's leverage for applying for larger grants as well. Great. Thanks. Thank you. James. Yeah, um, actually, I, I guess uh, I want to build on a few things that everybody has said. I, I think like Kate, um, last time when this was presented, I was like least excited, I think about the mapping uh, and then uh, the kind of determining of our problems in part because I, I kind of thought that maybe it was getting at too small of a level like that we're thinking about things on the city level and they're actually much larger than that but 
I've been thinking a lot about the, the proposals that we've gotten in this neighborhood grant program. And one of the, the missing pieces consistently is whether or not um, you can actually show that it's going to be a useful project. So mm -hmm. we've, we've had one group that um, the largest one that we've had so far uh, was to do some, uh, some basically try to slow down traffic and encourage pedestrian use. And that, I, I love that. Those are great ideas. But whether or not that particular project is the most useful one, we don't know. Um, it, it is a great place to go for money, for instance, if you'd want to start a community garden somewhere, or if you'd want to increase tree canopy in the neighborhood or something like that. I think there, those are all things that could be part of it. But kind of making a determination about what is the best use of our money as a community, mm -hmm. I think is a little bit difficult. And uh, for a lot of the ones that I've seen, what would have been really great is if people could have gotten like a, a feasibility study or some sort of a survey ahead of time to demonstrate why this was like a very good way to attack the problem. And it seems to me that at least where I'm leaning right now is that I think this gets to what Charles just said as well. If we actually want to be uh, kind of, uh, if we want to use our funds efficiently and use our person power efficiently, we need to be able to, to really think about this in a, in a, in a, in a planned way. Mm -hmm. And I think that the idea of making sure that we're actually thinking about what neighborhoods need what and what different parts of the cities need and being able to demonstrate that is a, th those are actual needs and these are actual tractable goals, uh, to me seems like a really uh, important, important place to go. That's fantastic, James. Okay. Can I just respond to that? Um, because Francie and I are working on this and the idea would be that if we're able to get this off the ground, then we may also be able to uh, apply for larger grant with GOCO in the February round. So that kind of speaks to what we are saying, like if we can, you know, get the seed funding in place, show some results and then go for larger funding. And I think this would also support the works in parks and natural resources in terms of their planning and implementation in terms of projects. So it would serve the city as a whole, because as you said, we'd be providing baseline data that people can use for further applications. Um, and I mean, I'm oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, I also think it would make the neighborhood applications really competitive as well, even in the sub program. Like if, let's say Mary wants to make a community garden, if she had a data set that she could go to, yeah, if she could go to, to help boost up the case as to why this would be a really powerful thing, I think it would make her application a, pop a lot better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, or if we, if we wanted to recruit a bunch of front range students to do help us with data collection and research projects or to use students to help work on these things, right? Um, if we actually had like good arguments that these were positive things, I think it would make everybody's uh, uh, projects a little bit easier. James, also please consider participatory needs assessments. I have trained people yeah. to do that and the inhabitants of a particular pay, place are the ones that know their needs the most. Mm -hmm. There's not, and oftentimes you don't need to bring experts in to assess that. So if these students were trained in participatory methodologies, you could do a needs assessment very easily, very easily by the neighborhood themselves and then from the, once they know their needs, it's very easy, you know, to lead the conversation towards solutions of those needs. And it is very empowering as well, if it's done by them from, you know, inception, design to implementation. Okay, I see you there, Annie. Before I... I see Mary and Annie. Um, I, I do. I'm keeping an eye on the time. Uh, we. That's my concern. I just okay. wanted to check in and do a time check because I'm afraid we're not going to get to some other things on the agenda. Just yeah. a quick, so I just want to add a quick thing to to Violetta, and again, this ties into some other concerns other folks have brought up, Adam and others. Um, when we go to the low income and um, not necessarily English first language speaking um, communities. 
uh, and neighbors uh, throughout our city. Um, how are we going to reach them in a way where we're actually meeting their needs? Frankly, if we had a, 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 a survey that went to people that said, would having a garden or a community garden help you to meet your food security needs? You would get much more investment um, in this from people who aren't necessarily interested in the environment as sort of a secondary concern. And I, I'm concerned that this, uh, that we might have people who, you know, are, you know, are almost more the, the middle class, upper middle class, who are concerned about the environment outside of their immediate security needs who are going to be most invested in this. And this goes to what Violetta has often reminding us about communicating um, about the real needs and to people actually in their languages. Can I, can I respond to that? And sure. Also ask Francie potentially to join in. I think this is why Mary Lynn, <clears throat> we completely agree and why we would like to prioritize the climate equity and engagement specialists specifically for okay. that. How do, you, how do you reach these communities where English is not their first language and to actually identify their needs and work with them as right. opposed to yeah, the other. I'm glad we're all in agreement on that. So I'm, I'm, I have no more questions we can find if everyone else wants to. <laughs> You have another question, is that what you said? No, I'm done. Okay, okay. So, Atara, we now owe you a, a list of priorities, is that correct? Ideally, if you were able to, to make it easy for you, what I was hoping is that you would rank the priorities that I presented yes. in your order of preference. Um, okay. I don't know the most efficient way to do this as a group, but Heather, do you mind putting those back up? I think it's the next to last slide, if I'm remembering correctly. Is that that? That's no, our next next one. Well, that will that will do as well. It's the same okay. same thing. It's the same list. Yeah, you can use that grid. Okay, so it's uh, the climate equity and engagement specialist, the mapping, the tree program, then our soul and uh, the soul and SNS. That I had combined those. Those are expanding existing programs. Okay, and and okay. bear in mind we have you know we've already prioritized the neighborhood impact granting program, so that was taken out of the available twenty five to fifty thousand that we were assuming would go towards new priorities. Does okay. that make sense? So, so basically, it, there are, we have three choices, expanding existing programs, the mapping, and the specialist. Yes, so we, we, you could also include the low-income tree program, but I have a feeling that's kind of fallen a bit further Oh, down. okay, okay. I thought that was, okay. all right, so there we go. <laughs> Those are our four choices. Um, so, I, so can, I, can, can we just um, uh, see if we agree that the risk mapping is the most important? It seems like we've sort of settled on that as a group, or am I mishearing what we're saying? I could we I, just take a vote on that. Yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing, Mary. That um, that seemed to be very high priority because it provides right. the data and can inform us that can make all other programs more successful. Does anyone disagree with that? You do. Okay. No, does anyone disagree with that? That was a question. Okay. I agree with that. All right. All right. Uh, so we're in agreement. That's our number one. It, uh, then we have um, the, uh, the, the specialist, the expanding existing programs. I'm going to do it by, by memory. And then the low income tree program. Well, isn't um, the specialist the person who's going to be doing the risk mapping? I mean, isn't that really kind of number two? Or do I misunderstand that? They're two different um, programs. Okay. I, thought, Heather, I think, it, Heather, it might be more useful to go to the second to last slide, because I think Thank this you. one's a little bit confusing. Okay. That one, use that one. Perfect, okay. Um, okay, so uh, the, the specialist low-income tree or uh, expanding existing programs, I'm gonna, I would vote for the uh, specialist as the next priority. I'm going to agree with that if we can be informal. That was going to be my, my suggestion as well. Uh, yep. Well. 
Okay. Okay, that's number two. Gosh, this is going well, guys. Um, we've got now to expanding existing programs or a low-income tree. Expanding um, existing programs. I would say I, would, I agree with Violetta. I agree with Violetta as well. I agree as well. We've, we've done it. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank right. you so much. Thank you. Oh, no movements or seconds. <laughs> Apparently, we all hate trees. <laughs> <laughs> but we like uh, we like poor people. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Atra. Thank you, Atra. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just uh, briefly, uh, if if you didn't know about these sustainable neighborhood grants, there is still time to get an application, and if you do have an idea, and there is still money to give away, so. Uh, if you do have ideas for your neighborhood. Um, but I think that having this data is gonna make all of those projects yeah. uh, a lot more powerful. Does the money roll over if we don't use it this year so that next year we can make more informed? Oh, darn, so we have yeah. to use it. We need to use it. Okay, yeah. thanks, James, that's good to know. I, I just have one last question about the position. Is it going to be a, a preferred bilingual you know, position? That's a good question. The climate equity specialist? Yeah. I believe that would be a priority. Thank you. Francie is nodding. All right. He's talking, you know. It's a good question. Thanks, Violetta. Okay. Um, with that, I'm going to pass the floor over to uh, Charles and Francie for a waste diversion update. Please. Let me know when I'm good to go. From my end, you're good to go. Heather, can you pull up the presentation? Thank yep, you. give me one second here. Thank you. While Heather is putting that presentation up, I want to thank you guys for uh, letting me come and talk trash with you all. I love this. I love starting it off that way. Um, the presentation is kind of a little bit, I'm joining the front end of Francie's presentation that's going to talk about our life cycle analysis on waste. But I was asked to do a little presentation to just to, because we have a couple of new members uh, to just talk a little bit about what our current programs are in solid waste. And then also I wanna talk about an upcoming council presentation up in October, um, October the 20th. Um, the next slide, please. Um, oh, that's what that is. So all I wanted to do is talk about this slide here. So our current program uh, for the new, for, for everyone to know, Longmont is unique in the state of Colorado and really across the nation. It's, one of, it's a municipality that runs and owns its own solid waste program, which is a good thing. And what we do here is we, we break our services apart, as you see here in core services and opt-in services. And um, our core services that we do are curbside trash, curbside recycle, and of course our recycling center that we call the Waste Diversion Center. So hopefully you've all been out there and hopefully you all use our services. And then we have an opt-in service, right? We initiated curbside compost, so food waste and yard waste. We initiated that in spring of 2017. So that's another service. And then we have a la carte services. So we try to provide other services available to our community when they have wastes or things that don't fit in the curbside bin. So we have large item pickup services or you can rent a dumpster because every once in a while you have a lot more uh, stuff. But in addition to that, we have what we call supplemental services and they really lean towards recycling. So we have paper shredding events. So that's really for your documents. So we do a monthly document shredding at the recycling center and we do have landfill drop-off days. It's a, a, a service that's included with our contract with the landfill. So sometimes people just have big things that aren't recyclable. It gives an opportunity so we don't have a dirty community and there's illegal dumping everywhere. Um, spring branch collection, fall leaf collection. We offer some holiday recycling. So, um, and then the other piece really that's huge is the hazardous, um, we call it the household hazardous waste program where it helps our residents to be able to not throw in the landfill, but to best manage paints and chemicals and oils and all that stuff. Um, that's really the, the current programs that we have. And what I wanna share, because I'm kind of short for time today, 
is we will be um, speaking with our council, Polly, um, on October 20th, we're coming up to council to talk about our solid waste program. And we're gonna talk about our solid waste program and, um, and talk about what we currently do and maybe what, how, and how should we revision our solid waste program as we move forward because there's a number of other communities that offer a variety of different things like hard to recycle, TV recycling, things that we're not currently doing. So our intent to meet with council is to talk about, you know, again, what we do, what other communities do, and what are the options that we could potentially do in the future. And I, I um, in our, I have a little cheat sheet on the side here, so I don't wanna mess up here. but. Some of the items, we're going to make suggestions to council, but we want to hear our council. Um, we're going to want to hear from our council as to what they would like to see sanitation do. But we're going to make some, not recommendations, but suggestions that could include changing how we do our compost program. So should our compost program be uh, mandatory for everybody? Should it be embedded in our trash rates? Um, should we offer smaller compost bins? Because that's a feedback we get from our customers. You know, the big bin's great, and everybody understands why we started that way, but it'd be nice to have a smaller one. Or even talk about recycling. Should recycling, should we offer additional recycle bins to our community? Should it be free? Should it be, you know, those are pretty basic. Um, we want to talk about our recycling center. Um, let me, let me, I'm getting called here a bunch of times here. Hold on one second. I apologize for that. But our recycling center is a great resource that our community has and many communities wish they had one, but, but there is, um, it's time for it to grow and to become, you know, its next phase because it was built back when we were about 40 or 50,000 people and, you know, we're hitting that 100,000 mark. But other concepts will be universal recycling ordinance, ordinance, right? So other communities have said all entities in a city must have trash recycling and compost. Um, we'll talk about C and D recycling, which is an important piece, um, construction and demolition. Um, should we require zero waste for all city sponsored events? So there's just a number of items that we're going to put as a discussion topic for our council to talk about. And it's really, um, I'm happy to share that with you all, but the biggest thing I'd like from you all is um, if you have suggestions or if you, I encourage you to attend this, the council meeting on October the 20th, or um, if you can't attend, if you want to submit your uh, thoughts or ideas to your council or uh, all these listening here, um, to make sure that we're all on the same plane. Many of those items I, I bullet point, I highlighted right now really are items that are kind of already in our sustainability plan, but it's really the opportunity to say, City of Longmont, do we wanna go that route? And there might be some costs associated with it and how do we best spread that equity or that cost across our, our community? And then to be very mindful of that. So that's really what I was gonna to share today. And I know that part of Francie's presentation really touches base on the data and the facts. So there may be questions for me towards the end as well. All right, thank you, Charlie. Great, if we can, do we wanna do, sorry. I didn't know if we wanted to do questions oh. Charlie now or later, Kate. Yeah, yeah, can we hold off on questions until after Francie's presentation? Thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, this will actually factor into the kind of, we'll be presenting this, something similar to the city council presentation, um, and we'll factor into the decision making process of how we go forward with our waste services program. But what I'm going to present is, um, we did a greenhouse gas life cycle analysis for our waste services. So for those who are at our last meeting, I gave an update on our 2019 greenhouse gas inventory. Um, but one thing we did new for 2019 is do a specific uh, life cycle analysis. And the reason we did this for our waste services is because the GPC protocol, um, which we use, which is a very good inventory, but for waste services, doesn't factor in all components. It really only looks at methane emissions that are produced from our waste services. 
It doesn't um, factor in potential offsets that occur from recycling or composting. So basically by recycling, we don't get emissions from using new materials um, or emissions before the materials even created through the manufacturing and raw material process. So there are processes throughout the entire life cycle of a piece of waste that can either generate emissions or create avoided emissions. So you may even have some negative emissions because you're recycling or you're storing um, um, carbon in, 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 instead of releasing it back into the atmosphere. Next slide. So I know there's a kind of a big confusing uh, diagram here, and I more just wanted to pull this up to show how complicated the EPA WARM model is. Um, so you don't need to figure out all different components of it. But the EPA WARM model is the kind of the best industry standard for doing a life cycle analysis for waste. So you can see kind of highlighted from this diagram that just looking at aluminum cam, you're fracturing in raw materials, using recycled materials through the life cycle, and how it's recycled or if it's put in the trash. There's a lot of different things that go into this model and make it a more comprehensive model of looking at our greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. Um, well, <laughs> sorry. That's okay, I was just a little confused there. Um, before I go into what our emissions actually are, I just wanted to give an overview of our current waste stream. So the city of Longmont is, only, is one of many haulers. We actually only haul about 33 percent um, of our waste services, mostly a single family and some multifamily. We have other commercial haulers and construction demolition make about 67 percent. Out, out of this to all three haulers, about 17 percent is recycled and 6 percent composted. I do want to make a note, even though our city of Longmont data is very accurate, other commercial uh, haulers and construction demolition um, it's being tracked through Retrack, which is a Boulder County tracking system that only recently got launched. So it requires the folks to self-report. So we may have different haulers who aren't used to using that program. So there may be some data inaccuracies, but this will give us a kind of a good starting point for understanding our waste streams and emissions. Next slide. So if you look based on the different haulers, um, City Longmont's doing the best with recycling about 21% and composting 12%. Then other commercial haulers is about 18% recycling and 3% composting, and construction and demolition is doing the worst at only 5% recycling and 1% composting. So if we take all these different waste streams and calculate the emissions using the EPA WAR model, on the next slide, um, we can actually look at our emissions. So the reason I wanted to highlight avoided emissions when I was giving the summary is because our current emissions from our entire waste stream is actually negative which is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, the main reason is because recycling has such a huge impact um, on avoided emissions from creating if we were, weren't recycling at all. And that's where most of our avoided emissions are coming from. You do see, even though we don't compost a lot, you do see composting has an impact. And even our landfills um, have negative instead of positive emissions, which I know, um, is a bit counterintuitive because a lot of people when they think of landfills they think of methane being released but because of how our landfills are designed when a uh, waste item is being broken down it actually doesn't fully if it was just in the like uh in kind of sitting on the ground it would fully break down and release all emissions into the atmosphere because it's in a landfill it actually stores some of that carbon so we're having more carbon being stored than actually being released <coughs> why we still see a negative but you can see our most of our um, waste is being landfilled and it's only a small negative why only I think it was like 16 percent is being recycled and that has a huge impact so if we can increase our recycling and composting that can have even more avoided emissions so what, what <laughs> units are those Francie sorry could you tell us the units oh sorry metric tons uh, carbon dioxide equivalent okay thank you Next slide. Um, so, um, so we looked at different scenarios. If we kind of do business as usual, we expect our waste to increase by 36% and our um, avoided emissions to increase about the same amount of percentage. 
So a first scenario, if we start increasing residential and commercial waste diversion, we, see, we can see up to a 152% increase by 2050 in avoided emissions. So this is, um, usually increases are bad, but increase in avoided emissions is really good. Um, in our second scenario, if we go even more ambitious and specifically focus on construction and demolition, we can actually see up to 179% increase in avoided emissions. Um, and I want to highlight that 202,912 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent being avoided is about equal to the, is just under the amount that our single, our, uh, sorry, our residential um, emissions from electricity in 2019. And for those who were at our last meeting, electricity usage is one of our greatest emitter, uh, emitters for the city. So you can see that actually having this um, great increase in waste diversion can actually really um, help our overall emissions and decreasing our emissions as a city. Uh, next slide. So opportunities to help do this is expand what can um, be recycled and composted and the different ways of doing that. Focus on construction and demolition, improve landfill management practices. Our, our landfills are well designed, but they can be even better designed to reduce emissions even more. And then importantly, source reduction. We always say reuse, reduce, recycle, and start with reuse. If we don't need more materials, we don't need more raw materials, um, that will have a huge impact on reducing our emissions. So next slide. So tying it back to kind of Charlie's presentation, um, we'll be going with the greenhouse gas inventory and highlighting this uh, life cycle analysis to city council on October 20th as well. So this gives city council another factor to think about uh, along with evaluating cost and resources on where we can go with our waste services program. And then once we get direction from city council, we can decide what scenario um, we would like to pursue and add that to our sustainability plan. Um, so thank you, um, and thank you, and feel free to ask either Charlie or I uh, questions. Very nice presentation, Francie. I just have one thank quick Wait, real quick, before we go into questions, Annie, how much time are you gonna need uh, for that mission update? Um, well, I could be pretty brief, but you guys might wanna discuss right. it. We, I could present uh, real briefly and you guys could ponder and discuss it next meeting. Okay, okay. So uh, the other piece of what I wanted to bring up in my discussion is the agendas for upcoming meetings. So, uh, Okay, well, we have six minutes. <laughs> so I'd like to, to rush through uh, questions and, uh, and the rest of the agenda if we can. So Charles, I saw you, see your hand and uh, Mary, uh, Adam, can I just suggest that we um, continue the conversation with Francie at the next meeting? I, I, I think this model is highly problematic and we're not going to be able to get through it in this meeting. Um, I like that idea. Um, how do, how does that work from the staff <laughs> level? Does that, can we do that? So we have a lot of things on the upcoming agendas um, and I'm making some recommendations about what should be on the agendas based on what's coming up before council. So um, I guess if you want to see what I'm proposing, you could see how it's going to fit in. I feel like all our meetings are going to be tight. <laughs> okay. But maybe, maybe you could look at the agendas and decide what you want to take off. Okay. Um, Let's go ahead and have a, a couple of questions for uh, Francie and Charlie, and um, and let's try to keep it. Keep it Charles, so I'm going to pass it to you. Yeah, so actually I actually have a lot of questions about recycling, and uh, but I won't ask them. I'll ask just a brief one. But um, some communities have uh, multiple bins for recycling. We have a single bin, which means we shift the cost of sorting to the city rather than having some of that sorting burden being carried by the residents? Have we thought about going to multi-bin recycling? Um, that's a great question. And before I get into that, if we're gonna be running short on time, I'm happy to receive emails and I could respond to you guys back. So charles.cam, you need to say, Annie will give my information. But the county went to a single stream collection program. So it's not just like Longmont wants yeah. to do X, 
So we have to work as a group, as in a consortium uh, in our state. So it's really the plan was to go to uh, single stream recycling for the purpose of making it easier for the consumer and to increase the amount of recycling. Because a lot of people, opposite of what you're saying, Charles, I don't want to put each bottle and have six different uh, containers out front. So for convenience, the industry has moved into that single stream, although at some level, sorting it out ahead of time makes a lot of sense too, but it, it's really a consortium from the whole community or the state and our county driving right. that. And, and one that other quick question, uh, the, um, I'm, as we go to electrification and we have, for example, electrified transportation you know, batteries are becoming a big, and, and not and portable electronics in general, but a big resource stream for valuable materials. Do we That's have, do we have a battery? Is this part, is battery part of our recycling program? So rechargeable batteries are part of our recycling program at the recycling center. But your point is well taken though when it comes to car batteries or those large things. And I think that's part of some bigger thinking and, and conversation with our, our council. Do we want to expand and have some real hard to recycle programs? And then I can come back and provide some analytics about what's it gonna cost. But absolutely, we do have uh, rechargeable battery recycling available at our recycle center though. Got it. Right. My, my comment is fairly quick as well. I think we really need to look at these models. I think, I feel like I say this every meeting, when you're only looking at carbon, you end up conflating issues that are highly concerning and you end up creating, um, avoiding uh, looking at other waste issues and other uh, pollution issues. Uh, for example, the idea that a um, formaldehyde laden um, toxic chemical laden piece of plywood uh, buried in a landfill is considered a net plus because the carbon is being stored um, and we're not looking at the fact that that is contributing to uh, downstream waste, uh, desolation of groundwater and so forth. I think we need to go to a multivariate analysis and, I, and the city which is a pioneer in so many ways including all of these great waste diversion methods could be a pioneer in taking a multivariate analysis to waste i i that it just really bothers me to see that as an as a as a net plus thanks for that comment um do, adam i know you had your hand up do you want to quickly yeah i'll be really quick thanks a lot charlie and francie for the presentation i'll just touch upon and expand a uh, question from charles and that is does the city have uh plans for considering electronic waste in general like cell phones, for example, or computer parts and not just batteries. I'm thinking particularly uh, electronics that have heavy metals like lead or cadmium and so on. The short answer is that's on the table for our conversation. Um, with, with, with cutting edge recycling, so to speak, I do, I'm from California too, so we do a lot, a lot more back in California and other states. But here in Colorado, it's relatively new, especially with some of the bans of electronics. The price of recycling electronics is fairly high, so that has to be discussed and balanced with our community to make sure, because I hear a lot through our sustainability and equity talks here that it's important that we don't overcharge our residents. But the point, simple answer would be yes, there are programs we could initiate, but there's a cost to it, and how would we want to pay for that? Did I address that, Adam? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Anyone else before we pass it over to Annie? All right, um, I, Annie. The floor okay, is so I have four slides and if Heather can bring them up, I'll try to be brief. Okay, so I, I wanted to talk about the role of the Sustainability Board in the context of the conversation last month about quasi-judicial authority, and also in the context of upcoming agendas. So I had reached out to the city attorney's office to find out more about what is a quasi-judicial board, and I also looked at the city code um, to see how the Sustainability Board role is articulated, and it's described in chapter 2.96. Um, so 
as it's highlighted here, um, the sustainability board role is to advise council on plans, policies, and actions related to environmental quality and sustainability. So I, I want you to think about that in context of our upcoming agendas and what we schedule um, and in the context of quasi-judicial versus an advisory board. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, Heather, please. Um, so what I learned from the city attorney's office and from looking at the city's webpage is that quasi-judicial boards are created by an ordinance and they're given power by state statutes and essentially they involve council delegating authority that council would normally have to these boards. Um, so next slide, please. So um, in Longmont, the term board, commission, authority, is all synonymous. And there are currently 22 boards and commissions, and only two of those are quasi-judicial, and they deal with requests um, to exceptions to building codes, so they're very specific. Um, so essentially, for the Sustainability Advisory Board to be quasi-judicial, council would need to delegate that authority to the Sustainability Advisory Board and delegate authority on very specific items that council would otherwise make decisions on. So um, that's what I learned about quasi-judicial. Um, so with that in mind, um, I, 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 I don't know what the process would be, but um, you know, basically council would have to um, turn over the authority that they currently have to the sustainability board. So um, the current role of council, or sorry, the current role of the sustainability board, um, if you could go to the next slide, sorry, Heather, is um, to advise council on environmental and sustainability things. So given that role, I wanted to talk about the agenda. <laughs> and so we've made some changes, we moved what was on the September agenda, um, this, which was the transportation roadmap, we've moved that to October. And so a lot of things are going to council in October and November. And so this is an opportunity for the Sustainability Advisory Board to weigh in and either be informed on, on things that are going to council or to advise council on decisions related to these things. So I wanted to check in with you. Um, the board gets to essentially decide what topics are on the agenda, but um, I thought it would be a good idea for you to understand what's going to council. So in October, we had originally had um, a presentation scheduled on water efficiency and education and outreach. And I'm proposing that we move those from October to November in order to add an update on the solar feasibility study, which um, we are bringing to council in October, as well as an IGA that's on the NREL um, effort, which is looking at the Habitat for Humanity project that um, Longmont Power and Communications is entering into an agreement with NREL on an IGA, and that's going to council. And so I'd like to have the opportunity for LPC to present that information to the Sustainability Board in October, as well as this transportation roadmap, which is an equitable carbon-free transportation roadmap, looking at how we could reduce our greenhouse gas emissions um, in the transportation sector. And that's going to council in November. So we'd like that to go to the Sustainability Board. Um, we are also have scheduled in October the final projects, you know, getting your review and final project decision on this um, sustainability tax, which you reviewed tonight. So that's on the October schedule, or I'm proposing adding those items and moving water efficiency and education and outreach to November. In November, we had scheduled a presentation by CCL from Ginny Black, and there was going to be a presentation on electri electrification, but um, 
we really don't have a presentation prepared. We're really focusing on some of these other efforts that relate to electrification, like this NREL IGA. Um, so I'm proposing to remove that from the agenda. We also have these other things, pesticides and pollinators. We'll give an update on the climate action evaluation. And then the two items that were moved from October, water efficiency and education and outreach. So the point I'm trying to make is that there's opportunity for the sustainability board to weigh in on things that are going to council in October and November. Um, and we'd like to kind of move around the schedule to accommodate that. Um, and as you can see, it seems like we're always short on time. So I have um, provided some information on quasi-judicial board commission role. Um, and you're welcome to have a conversation about that. And perhaps you want to put it on a future agenda. Um, here, here's what I'm proposing for the next two months, given what's going to council. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I, I'm sorry this is so quick and brief, but uh, so, we, always seem, we always seem to be short on time. <laughs> uh, Charles, you had your hand up first and then Violetta. Yeah, I, I wonder if maybe Polly might comment on whether the council delegating authority is a non-starter or whether it's something that would be considered. I just, I just wonder about the general context in terms of how they, how they would feel about something like this, if Polly can read their minds. No, I can't read their minds, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I also thought that the Planning and Zoning Board was quasi-judicial. No? I don't know. The, I, this is what was on the web page. No, maybe it is. I don't know. I think it is. It would have to be. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a non-starter. I don't. Um, you would have to make a case for it. You would have to make a case for why uh, this board... Um, is in a position to make quasi-judicial uh, decisions about uh, sustainability issues. And um, I mean, I've been advocating for this board to be more <laughs> for, since it was uh, restarted. But anyway, um, I don't think it's a non-starter. I'm not sure that this is the year to do that because Right now, we're um, there, things are in so much flux. I mean, for everybody, but what we're talking about right now is budgetary issues, um, and we're eleven million dollars short. That's not as bad as a few months ago when we thought we were going to be eighteen million dollars short. So, I would say that maybe this is not. Don't I would say not to bring this up until maybe the. Uh, after January, when we have a better idea of when things are less in flux, and yeah, this, then we can make more decisions uh, that are uh, maybe of a lower level than just trying to keep a keep this town afloat. So, so but yeah, I that makes think, a lot of. Well, I, I what I really wanted when I brought back the sustainability plan was to um, have the sustainability advisor be. Uh, a cross departmental thing answering only to the city manager like other de department heads I think that would be a way that she's truly coordinating uh, all the departments which is what's kind of needed for an overall view of the sustainability of the whole city so moving in that direction thinking about moving in that direction of having the sustainability advisor position and this board being advi an advisor to her or to him or whoever. Um, I think it's something to think about in the future because I, it's important. It's the, you know, <laughs> but I, I do think it might be um, useful to wait a while. So, so, I, so that makes a lot of sense, Polly. Thank you. And yeah. part of the reason I'm asking that is partly to figure out whether we should do it or not based on what the council would allow, but also, um, you know, we need time to prepare. If we need to make a case, yes. if we need to justify why we, why we think we should do this, I don't think we want to be on the next council meeting's agenda. No, you we won't have time to make a good case. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we should discuss it 
over the next six months and try to make a plan for that. If that's something that everybody wants to do. I don't know that it's necessary, but I do think that we should make a plan. I mean, that we should be definitely overseeing some of the um, implementation of the climate action uh, plan. So, so I, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I guess that last sentence, Paul, that you said, because my question, um, I did read the minutes of the discussion. I wasn't at uh, last month's meeting over whether to become a commission or not. But then after the presentation today, it seemed like the use of the word, the term board, commission, committee was interchangeable in Longmont. And oh, according to the website, yes. Okay, so um, thank you for clarifying that, Annie. Um, I mean, so if it's not, obviously, Polly's definitely shaking her head. So <laughs> what is it, just succinctly, what is it that becoming a commission will allow us to do that we cannot do now? That's my question. The Housing Preservation Commission, uh, Housing Pre Historic, Preser Historic Preservation um, is a commission and they have the ability to demolish buildings, they have the ability to rule whether something, they have the ability to make legal decisions and they can be questioned or appealed, but they basically make those decisions. Likewise with planning and zoning, likewise with Master Board of Appeals. Um, and they there are consult council? But, a, but an advisory board only advises council on what they would suggest that council chooses to do uh, on a, an intelligent decision for council to make, which frequently council, of course, does not choose to do. But, you know, so that's the difference. One has the ability to actually rule on a decision and it doesn't go before council again unless it's appealed. So what would we, what kind of decisions are we seeking to rule upon? It's what yeah. I'm, what? That's what we need to talk about, whether we want to do that. Yeah. So, yeah, um, Mary, I know you had something to say and, and uh, James, I, I see you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Violetta. That was my primary question. My second question is, when I observe the process of things like the Climate Action Plan, which it, that it um, was created by a, a group of volunteers, and it went through a bunch of different groups with overlapping um, uh, 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 commissions, if you will, <laughs> um, overlapping missions, and then it went to us, and then it went to council, and then council threw it back to the staff. It seems to me like we have a lot of sort of cumbersome processes. And I would like to understand, um, in addition to uh, a judicial uh, or quasi-judicial authority, if there are ways in which we could work to simplify some of these input processes. Um, that's how, if, if we as a commission could be, could sort of take that seriously and think of some ways to simplify some of these different ways to focus in on decisions and get them to council. I, I think that's very, and a very appealing reason to become a board. Maybe Polly could, I'm a commission, maybe Polly could, could speak to that. So you want to um, de-bureaucratize bureaucracy, in other words, and sure. make government efficient. That's what we'd all like. Yeah. Good luck. But I mean, you know, it is always worth looking at process and trying to make it more efficient. And as you pointed out, it, this was a, it also, uh, before it came to council, it also went to the Transportation uh, Advisory Board. And it seems like a very cumbersome input. process. Well, it's the way to get democratic input on, right. you know. Well, one way, yeah. So, so. Uh, you know, it's worth thinking about and discussing. <laughs> I would certainly like to have things be less complicated and anyway. <laughs> hey, Jim. Yeah. 
I'll just be very brief. I think that's going to be our central challenge in making a case for us to have quasi judicial powers uh, is that because we are can, and we've all made this point can and should comment on almost everything that the city is doing because everything involves sustainability. Um, it seems that like uh, our scope if, if we just say that we should have some powers over sustainability, that means we have powers over everything. And I don't, I don't think that's gonna be, go very far. So I think we'd have to be very specific about what actual aspects of the process we think that we should uh, have say in like that uh, beyond advisory say. And I think that's gonna be a, a, a good discussion that we'd, we're gonna have to have um, at some point. But I think that's gonna be a, a big challenge. It's very different than historic preservation or something like that, that is uh, much more focused. Yeah, that's true. Tony, yeah. are, are we going to 5.30? No, we, we're, we're 20 minutes over at this point. And, <laughs> and I'd, I'd, I'd like us to, if, if there are further comments, can we push them onto maybe a January agenda um, so that we can, we can have some time to, to fully discuss this? Yeah. I move that we adjourn. Wait. <laughs> wait, wait. Yes, Annie. Can we go back and look at the agendas for next month and the following month and at least agree on those before you adjourn? Uh, fine. Works for me. Thank sure. you. Yep, sorry. Give me one minute. No worries. One more time. There you go. So uh, I, just real quick, I want to clarify that that electric electrification plan, it shouldn't say move from November to October. It should be just stricken completely. Well, the point being that there's certain things that we added, the solar feasibility, the NREL, and the Habitat project that are related to electrification. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. All right. Jim, I think you were... Um, yeah, I was just going to say that it makes sense to me. Anyone? We, we missed a lot of meetings, and I think we're doing our best, and this makes sense to me. Yeah. Any dissenting opinions there? All right, let's roll with it. Okay, uh, just to run through the rest of the agenda, um, any board items or council items? I'm gonna merge those into two or one. Okay, um, Violetta, would you like to make your motion again? <laughs> I hope that we adjourn this meeting, which was very fruitful but should end at some point. <laughs> I second that motion. All right, all in favor. All right. Aye. Aye. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. you guys, have a good night. Thanks. Bye.